I'm really humbled that, uh, that you asked me to come and, uh, and speak to you about, uh, about my, my journey through the writing world. Um, and it's wonderful to have a chance to uh, speak to such an enthusiastic group of writers. Um, I saw that my speech was listed in the program as lying for a living, which is, uh, <laughs> which is what I call my blog, and it's, 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 it's how I make, it's how I make, uh, make the rent. For me, uh, writing itself, uh, writing a novel, starts with two things, a compelling main character and a big idea to hang the story on. That's it. It really is that simple. And it only took me decades to understand this. <laughs> um, I wrote my first novel at 16. Um, it was a love story because I was 16, so I knew everything <laughs> about love at that time. And it was set at the Indianapolis 500 because I thought that a glamorous, uh, dangerous setting would give a love story pizzazz. So you can predict what it was about. Girl meets boy, boy drives fast car, boy crashes into a wall at 200 miles an hour and dies in a ball of flame. Um, <laughs> Girl is sad, she grieves. It was so sad I made myself cry. Um, then of course the heroine picks herself up and gets back into life. She meets a new man. He drives his car into a wall at 200 miles an hour, <laughs> bursts into flame and dies horribly. This happened over and over and over. So by page 63 I had killed off all the men in the novel and that was the end of the book. Uh, <laughs> But I put that away. I gave up on writing anything, uh, any romantic novels at that point. Um, in a couple of respects, I was very lucky. Uh, I had parents who told me I could do anything I set my mind to. And a dad who was an English professor. And he gave me a love of reading and taught me to strive for excellence. And he taught me what excellence meant. Um, he helped, helped me learn what excellence actually is uh, in writing and in books. Then in college, I was uh, very fortunate uh, to take a creative writing class from novelist Ron Hansen. I don't know if any of you know him, but um, he writes literary novels. Uh, he, his most recent uh, book that was made into a movie was uh, The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Um, and he taught me the basics of story structure, that you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, uh, things like that. Um, and he encouraged me to send out my work, uh, send out my stories for publication, which when you're 21, that's an amazing thing to hear from a, from a teacher. And I did, I, fall, I, I, I got up against him to send out one of my stories uh, to a small university press, and uh, it was published in an anthology by the University of California at Santa Barbara, and, in an anthology which was, pub, which was edited by Thomas Perry. Um, who, was, who had not even begun writing novels at that point. He and his, uh, his then brand new bride, Jo, uh, were, were editing this tiny little university literary anthology and they published one of my stories. Uh, so that, he was my first editor. Um, and I kept going, working on my own writing uh, while I was practicing law and while I was teaching at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, when my kids were little, I published magazine articles and I wrote uh, comic short stories. And eventually, I started writing a, a novel featuring an embryonic version of one of my series characters, Evan Delaney. And I had no idea what I was doing. In one early version of this novel, Evan's entire family disappeared. And it's not quite the dramatic story it sounds like. Evan was going to investigate the disappearance of everybody else in her family. Um, however, she spent 20 pages sitting in her brother's living room, staring at the walls before she got curious as to where everybody had gone. Um, it was just deadly. Uh, in the next version of the story, I spiced up a very quiet, talky scene by having the characters uh, walking down a street and they were interrupted by a blinding set of headlights, you know, at the end of the dark street. Uh, so they dashed to safety and then my would-be thriller screeched to a halt because I had no idea who was behind the headlights or why they were after anybody at all. Uh, the only thing the headlights meant was they were just a blinding sign that I had no plot. Um, <laughs> that's when I started teaching myself to plan novels so they have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and as few blinding headlights and other cliches as possible. Uh, eventually, I did finish a novel, 
it was about a bunch of amateurs pulling off a sting, and it featured a cast of thousands. Uh, it had witty dialogue and beautiful scenery and more convolutions than a strand of DNA, and it had one minor issue in that I was calling it a murder mystery, but nobody actually died. Um, so you will be unsurprised to hear that I stuck that one in a file cabinet uh, unpublished, thank God. Um, but I eventually rewrote it, and I got an agent. I was a wonderful agent in London, which is where I had moved at the time, uh, the late Giles Gordon. So while Giles sent out my first effort, I sat down and wrote uh, a new novel. It was called China Lake. And when Giles got hold of China Lake, he said, let's shelve this other project. Uh, he sent China Lake out to London publishers and he got an offer on it in 72 hours. Uh, the Brits took the novel right away, and American publishers said, no thanks. And this happened five times in a row. Uh, once U.S. publishers had passed on China Lake, they didn't care to pick up a series in midstream. And I didn't want to complain because, after all, I saw my, my novels in stores all over the world, except in my home country. And so it kind of got to the point where I would talk about, yes, I've just finished a new book, and my, you know, my aunts and uncles would say, Oh, yes, your books. <laughs> That's so nice for you, dear. <laughs> um, so I really decided that I, to con convince them that I wasn't absolutely insane, I, it would really help if I was published in the United States. Um, after five years, I was thinking this was not going to happen. But then chance and good fortune intervened in the most amazing way. Uh, serendipity is a wonderful word, and I'm really blessed that I can speak of a way that has touched my life. Um, Stephen King was packing for a book tour to the UK, and he was looking for a novel to read on his flight. We had the same British publisher, and of course they send him boxes of books to read, and uh, he pulled this box out of his closet and uh, opened it up, and he pulled out China Lake. And I wish that I could say that he read the first paragraph and felt so overwhelmed by the beauty of my prose that he fainted on the, you know, at the scene. But the truth is, he decided that the print was large enough for comfortable reading on a long flight. <laughs> and that's why he took the book along. Um, but when the flight landed, he had finished it, and he asked the publisher if I had written any other books. Anyway, he went on to read uh, the other four novels in the Evan Delaney series, um, and then because he's extraordinarily generous and supportive of other writers, he posted an article on his website urging readers to seek out my books, um, which was wonderful. Uh, I thought it was nothing he could do could have been better than that, but it didn't help me. No publishers called me up and said they were interested. Um, then to my everlasting joy and gratitude, uh, he wrote a column in Entertainment Weekly saying I deserve to be published in the United States and telling people to seek out the Evan Delaney series. And strangely, within 48 hours, 14 American publishers had contacted me. <laughs> and two weeks later, I had a contract with Dutton, which is an imprint at Penguin, and they signed up the Joe Beckett series, which I was just developing at the time, and their Penguin sibling, NAL, published the Evan Delaney novels. Uh, China Lake was finally published in the United States in 2008, and in 2009 it won the Edgar for Best Paperback Original, and in 2010 it was a finalist for NPR's 100 Best Thrillers Ever, uh, which was, needless to say, something that is still staggering to me. Um, Creating a vibrant story takes time and effort. As I said, it requires a compelling main character and a big idea to hang the story on. How you do this, for me, uh, it starts with brainstorming, which, I, which is basically my leave me alone period. Um, just so you'll understand what it involves for me, uh, here in no particular order is what I do when coming up with ideas. Um, walk the dog, clean my office, dig up scraps of paper on which I have scribbled plot ideas over the past four years, uh, scratch my head, wonder what bait, bad guy, and bus plunge mean, and how they could possibly form the basis of a coherent plot. Uh, drink coffee, order all of Joseph Campbell's books on mythology, tell the kids, I'm working, you make dinner, uh, decide I need a hairstyle that's new, and so does the dog, um, <laughs> scribble five pages of random notes that contain the words psych, Evan, ha ha ha, and don't forget to pay the phone bill. Um, <laughs> 
watched the entire season four of 30 Rock, continued to insist to the kids that I'm working, uh, list possible characters, sidekicks, villains for the new novel, cross off sparkly vampires in the high school glee club, um, get caught playing solitaire on my phone, and then finally sit my butt down and start writing. It's simple. Um, oh, and on the topic of inspiration, it's wonderful. It's a joy. It's when the universe lights up and whispers one of its secrets in your ear. Uh, but inspiration is not everything. I think you know this by now, but it's worth repeating. For writing novels, inspiration is neither necessary nor sufficient. Uh, this stuns some people. I was once at a friend's book launch uh, when her neighbors, uh, looking for something to converse about, uh, asked me, how often do you write? And I said, every day. And their faces went blank with confusion. And they said, even when you don't feel like it? Uh, and I said, especially when you don't feel like it. Um, you can always rewrite, but only if you've the words on the paper in the first place. So over the course of several months, I pound an idea into shape. Um, I figure out what's the conflict? Who's the antagonist? What does the heroine want more than anything? And how does the villain thwart that desire? Uh, this is plotting 101. It's fun and it's difficult. Um, and I, I should note that before I actually write a novel, I send the idea, a kernel of the idea, and then a synopsis, and then an outline to my agent and my editor. I would not dream of starting, much less finishing a book, without their input and approval. Um, I'm also lucky to have a husband who serves as both a sounding board for ideas and as my research guinea pig. Um, thriller authors write action scenes, and we want them to sound authentic. So um, one day when I walked into the living room and said, if I had you on the ground with your feet tied and I was kicking you in the ribs, could you take me down? Um, he didn't even bat an eye. He, he just played the part. Um, I should mention that he actually has a black belt in karate, so I'm not abusing him. Um, I'm drawing on his expertise in the discipline, really. Um, however, when the kids walked in and saw him on the carpet with my foot in his ribs and his arm around my leg about to break my knee, I did have a hard time explaining that no, mommy and daddy are not fighting. Um, <laughs> And while listening is extremely important, it's also important to discern who not to listen to. Uh, because of course, once you share your, your writing, you'll get criticism. Um, and how should writers deal with criticism? You have to consider the source and its authority. Uh, a trusted editor means you listen carefully. A jealous and angst-ridden creative writing classmate, you tread softly and watch for daggers thrown at your back. Uh, a reviewer who sneers at your gender or your nationality, just brush them from your shoulder like dust. Um, that's often easier said than done, but it's best to smile and take it and keep on writing the best stuff you can. If you take pride in your work, you can remember that if they criticized you, it means they read your book. <laughs> who to ignore? Online comment trolls and Amazon one-star reviewers. Uh, this is basic, but it's a place to start. Do not even read this stuff. Um, reading group members who uh, say about your new novel, I hate iBooks. Um, that really confused me uh, when someone said that. And tur it turned out to mean that she did not dislike iPads and Kindles, uh, but she loathed first-person narration. Um, <laughs> I. <laughs> so. The, you also ignore uh, the neighbor who praises your accomplishments by saying, isn't it nice that your hobby has turned into something? <laughs> um, uh, emails from readers. Generally, it's wonderful to correspond with people who've read your books. But it's impossible that everybody will like your work. So you have to take, with a grain of salt, um, messages saying, why do you use gutter language? Ignore people who say, I thought you'd be able to tell a story, but you're no James Patterson. <laughs> Remember, you're out there. You've shared your innermost uh, things, something that you've worked on and bled over and struggled and burped up your soul for these people. Um, you're out there. You're exposed. Take a deep breath. Um, 
you want people to care, don't you? So uh, who do I listen to? I listen to my writer's group. I don't always agree with them, but I trust they can identify the places in my work where the writing's flat or over the top or it's fallen into a gaping plot hole. I listen to my husband. He's my uh, first reader of the presentable draft, uh, an, an avid reader who has a very keen ear for false notes on the page. I listen to my agent and my editor. Uh, a, a brief sidebar on editors. I mentioned that the, the email complaint that the editor had not struck the similes from my work. Line editing like that or flagging word choice or typos is, is an important thing for an editor to do, but it's only one tiny particle of an editor's job. Uh, what it takes a while to understand uh, from a writer's point of view is how much more than a proofreader an editor actually is. An editor is more than a copy editor, and an editor is more than a critique partner. A good editor has a 30,000 foot view of a manuscript. Uh, he or she will see the forest and the trees. Uh, they'll understand plot, character, ways to hone the story to bring out elements that are swamped or underdeveloped. Um, working with an editor is, is collaborative. And while I outline, I always try to work toward a satisfying ending. Um, and sometimes the editor is the one who reads the draft and tells me, who's this character uh, who's lurking at the corners of the story? Um, he's bad, he's cunning, he's manipulative, uh, and wants so much for himself. Shouldn't he be behind things? Um, or isn't she the one who's been pulling the strings? And I'll note that an editor has never told me to change who done it, um, but they've seen where I stopped short. Uh, where I didn't dig deep enough, uh, where I left possibilities in the story unfulfilled, and they pushed me to go farther. Um, an editor who has skill at story building is priceless. A final note on publishing, uh, Marcia asked me whether I had any thoughts on, on where, the, where the industry is going. I know you've spent a whole day talking about that, so I can't possibly uh, go into any more detail uh, about uh, e-publishing than everything you've already heard today from a, a whole panoply of experts. Um, obviously, today, publishing as an industry is in the throes of huge change. Um, and in a few years, the business landscape is going to look distinctly different than it did in the 20th century or even in 2009. I talk about this frequently, and I will say what I've say tonight is even different than what I would have said six months ago. Um, uh, a lot of six months ago, uh, people were, were certainly in the UK, uh, still in Europe, uh, and I even hear it frequently in the US. It's like, I have to, uh, readers need books. I love books. It's not, it's not a real novel unless I can hold it in my hand. I love the smell of it. I love the feel of the pages. Uh, I'm hearing that much less today. Uh, from, certainly from, from American writers. Um, but the one thing I want to make clear is, um, the other day I read a comment that throughout human history there have been many societies without technology. But there has never been a society without stories. Um, don't fear. Uh, things may get rough and uncertain. And, Think of Betty Davis uh, saying, fasten your seat belts, it's going to be a bumpy night. Uh, that's what we're flying through right now. So hang on, but don't fear. Uh, your writers worry about the writing. As far as what's going through your mind when you're constructing a story, be platform neutral. I'm not in the business of selling paper pulp. Um, I love physical books. But if a reader decides that they want my book or your books, um, on a screen uh, or through a jack into their mind, um, they're going to get it. And there is nothing wrong with people reading your stories in different forms. It's fine. Embrace it. Likewise, don't fear that you must put all your energies into instant um, ebooks right now, uh, that if you hesitate, uh, you'll be left behind in the ebook rapture. Um, <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> Concentrate on writing because story will endure. People want stories. They need stories. They cannot live without stories. Humanity needs great stories, not just as entertainment. 
as lessons, as inspiration, as guideposts to how we live, uh, to what it is that makes a life. Men and women have been telling stories to explain and explore life for thousands of years. We're the storytellers. So take a deep breath and forge onward. You're not alone. The responsibility for the writing is on your shoulders, and it'll be your name on the cover of a book, your work, but others will be with you. Uh, they're here, and I'm looking at all of them. Um, thank you for inviting me to uh, join your circle. So thanks. Okay. Uh, the question is, do I still do book tours, and do I think the internet is making book tours less important for writers? I, I, I do book tours. I did a book tour this summer. That was my summer vacation, <laughs> driving across Texas, <laughs> so, which was great. Um, book tours are, are expensive for a publisher. Um, book tours take a lot of time for an author. It's a great way to meet uh, booksellers. The question is whether uh, book tours can be as helpful as coming to a conference where you meet so many more wonderful readers who've gathered all in one place. I think publishers are really looking to have uh, writers come to conferences. They're looking for any way to, for writers to, to reach out for virtual book tours, blog tours, media exposure. Uh, so I think that publishers are, are seriously reevaluating the idea of, uh, of a book tour. But, but we still see how it, uh, how it shakes out.